Okay. okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Rosina Desar. So I just graduated in Master's in Civil and Environmental Engineering from Washington State University this summer in August. Today, I'll be presenting the IPCC report summary for policymakers 2021. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Avinok Mehta for providing me this opportunity to speak in this platform. Before getting started with the presentation, I have a couple of slides that I would like to share with everyone here. So our team, TGIS, uh, provides services in different sectors like live webinars, hands-on workshop, personal coaching, and consulting services. So our top webinars includes QGIS beginner course, hydrology groundwater, forestry applications, QSW80 modeling, air and water modeling. We are also open to mapping online, learn the art of mapping online, and also open for uh, taking workshop or providing GIS webinars for different uh, organizations and universities, as well as our team also provides consultancy services in different sectors like forestry, geology, hydrology, land use mapping, environmental services, and urban planning. Getting started with today's presentation on IPCC. So the outline of the presentation is IPCC. We will just touch base on the intergovernmental panel on climate change, evidence of climate change, future projections, followed by mitigation, adaptation, and sustainable development. So the brief history behind the IPCC formation. In October 1985, there was a meeting of scientists on climate change in Austria, which was sponsored by United Nations. So in that meeting, the scientists concluded that there could be a historic rise in global temperature because of the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases. That being said, in 1988, US experienced some unusual hot summer and sustained drought in some parts of the United States, which was then pointed to the human influence on climate by NASA. Then after that, there was a meeting discussion held between US government, WMO and UNEP. Later then US government decided to support intergovernmental scientific panel to assess climate change. Then by the end of 1988, IPCC was established, which was supported by the US, made up of 195 member countries. So the main objective of IPCC and objectives and principle of IPCC are, the objective is to provide assessment reports on the state of knowledge of climate change at regular intervals. And the point here, the key point here is the IPCC does not conduct any research. It is only responsible for producing the assessment reports uh, of the research conducted by other organizations. And the principle is the IPCC is policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. Also provide the scientific integrity with openness, objectivity, and transparency. So the IPCC consists of three main structure, IPCC plenary, IPCC bureau, and IPCC executive committee. And different working group are responsible for different tasks, like working group one is responsible for the physical science basis. Working group two is responsible for climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability assessment. Three is responsible for mitigation of climate change. And the technical system unit is responsible for task force on national greenhouse gas inventories. So the very initial step in writing and review process includes uh, the outline uh, is drafted 
and developed by experts nominated by government and observer organizations. Then this outline is approved by the panel team, then reviewed by the expert as authors who are nominated by government and observer organizations. Then this approved draft is then again reviewed for the first order draft by the expert review. Then for the second order draft, it is reviewed by the government and the export review takes place for the second order draft. Then this draft is uh, finalized and along with the summary for policymaker, then this final draft report and summary for policymaker is then forwarded to the government review team, which is then finalized under the government review for the approval of the publication of the report. Once the report is approved and accepted by the government review team, then the report is published. At the end, uh, the all the IPCC policy uh, is governed by the government team. So even after the publication, if the report has any error in the published report, there's a system or tool called error protocol which is used to correct that error. There are a series of report published since the establishment of IPCC. So initially, IPCC was jointly established by WMO and UNEP in the year 1988. And the first assessment report was published in the year 1990. In 1995, second assessment report Similarly, third assessment report, fourth assessment report, fifth assessment report. So the important thing here in the fifth assessment report was in the year 2015, Paris Agreement was established or formed, which we will discuss in detail in the upcoming slides about Paris Agreement. Now we are recently in the assessment report six, which is soon going to be published in 2022. So talking briefly about the assessment report six, IPCC currently is in its six assessment cycle. During this cycle, the panel will produce three special reports, a methodology report and AR6 assessment report six. So the special report, three special report includes a special report on global warming of 1.5, which is a very hot topic in today's environmental concern, global warming, which we will discuss in our upcoming slides as well. And special report on the ocean and cryosphere in the changing climate and climate change. Special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and greenhouse gas fluxes in terrestrial ecosystem. A methodology entitled 2019 Refinement to the 2006 IPCC Guideline for National Greenhouse Gas Inventories. The assessment report six synthesis report will be finalized in the first half of 2022, which uses, uh, which will use CMIP-6. CMIP-6 is a climate model, recent climate model. So here we will watch a short two minute videos on IPCC special report on global warming 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we will get back to our presentation. We'll continue the presentation after this video.
so the term paris agreement the paris agreement sets long term goals to guide all the nations so the three key elements of the paris agreement on climate change are to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions to limit global temperature increase in this century to 2 degrees celsius while forcing efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees celsius also to review to review countries commitments every 5 years and to provide financial support to the developing countries and enhance their abilities to adapt climate impacts so after all these uh, videos and the previous slides how close are we to 1.5 degrees celsius so we'll discuss here about that the figure here on the right uh, we have here is global temperature change relative to 1850 to 1900 on the y axis and on the x axis we have the time period year from 1960 to 2100 future projections which uh, the summary of this graph here is uh, so this 1850 to 1900 is a pre industrial age and comparison to this in the decade 2006 to 2015 warming reached 0.87 degrees celsius plus minus 0.12 degrees celsius relative to pre industrial age here we can see the time period 2006 to 2015 in between somewhere here by 0.87 So the global temperature is rising by 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade, and reached 1 degree Celsius above the pre-industrial level around 2017, which is marked over here in the year 2017. And the study, if the same global warming or increase uh, keeps on increasing the same trend, it would reach 1.5 degree Celsius around the year 2040. and the study has shown that this is predominantly due to the human activity increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere communicating uncertainties ipcc uses very specific terminology to communicate uncertainties in the report so we have here in the table we have different range of probability for communicating the term uncertainty for virtually certain 99 to 100% is probability very likely 90 to 100% likely 66 to 100% about as likely as not 33 to 66 unlikely 0 to 33 very unlikely 0 to 10% exceptionally unlikely 0 to 1% is probability so there is a very uncertain or there is uncertainty in the climate model and in the report how did the ipcc describe uncertainty and what progress have been made in narrowing down these uncertainties so for uncertainty the scientific method uh, that are employed for the prediction of climate change due to the increase in greenhouse gases regard to the timing magnitude and regional pattern of climate change there is incomplete understanding which leads to uncertainty so there are different factors in the environment the, in the system which leads to uncertainty some of them are sources of greenhouse gases clouds which is strongly influence the magnitude of climate change oceans which influence the timing and patterns of climate change and for this to uh, narrow down this uncertainties different upgraded numerical model run on computers have been used for addressing these problems so the temperature change observed changes in the climate we have here that for the change in the temperature the figure the map here shows the observed changes in surface temperature from 1901 to 2012 and we can see here it ranges from negative 0.6 to 2.5 degrees celsius so we can see here uh, 2.5 degrees celsius in some part of the map the extreme increase in the temperature and this is observed change similarly the figures the graph on the left here represents the observed 
globally averaged but combined in land and ocean surface. This is temperature anomaly, not increase in temperature. So this is temperature anomaly from 1850 to 2012 relative to 1986 to 2005. And then the first graph here is the annual average and the bottom is decadal average. So the key takeaway from this, both of the graph here we can see is increasing trend, the positive increasing trend in the temperature change, increase in temperature due to global warming, which is global warming, sorry. And the graph here, this is, uh, this graph was taken from the summary for policymaker report 2021 IPCC. Here, uh, it is showing the change in global surface temperature on the y-axis. And we have the time period from 1850 to 2020 recent time on the x-axis, where the observed temperature is represented by this dark black line, the observed temperature. And also here is the comparison between the simulated using the human and natural forces, which is represented by the brown shade and the brown line here, simulated and human natural with comparison to simulator using only natural forces without human influence on the climate. Here we can see the differences of the human influence in the climate, how the temperature is rising because of anthropogenic forces in the atmosphere. Now, this the same thing, human influence and climate change is uh, shown here by breaking down in the land surface, land and ocean surface, he ocean heat content where this blue box or blue shade represents the model using only natural forcing and the pink shade represents the model using both natural and anthropogenic forcing where we can see the influence of human influence and the climate change the pink line with the natural and human human influence being uh, like rising higher than the blue shade which is only natural forcing we can uh, see the same pattern in all three uh, different areas, land, land and ocean, and ocean heat content, except for this Antarctica and Arctic. But the, but the study and the research has shown that anthropogenic influences have very likely contributed to Arctic sea since 1979. And also it is very likely that there is a substantial anthropogenic contribution to the global mean sea level rise since the 1970s. So with very with every increment, with every increment of global warming, changes gets larger in the regional mean temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture. So first let us talk about the temperature change. Here we have annual mean temperature change at one degree Celsius global warming, where these two map on the top is showing the observed changes for one degree Celsius global warming and the same at the one degree Celsius, but this is simulated. This one is simulated, right? And the left one is observed. Now here we have the simulated changes with the increase in temperature, increase in temperature at 1.5 degree Celsius, two degree Celsius and four degree Celsius where the by simulating these changes at different temperature, here the temperature ranges from zero to seven degrees Celsius in different parts of the continents or this map. The key takeaway from these five graphs here are, so this uh, across the warming level, land areas warm more than ocean. We can see that uh, this land surface are getting darker, which represents the more temperature than compared to this ocean area. And it has more warming in this upper northern face of the map, which is Arctic and Antarctica, more than this tropic area, which is this in between these two lines because of the increase in temperature. So for the annual mean temperature change relative to 1850 to 1900, again, here we have a map simulated change at 1.5 degrees Celsius, two degrees Celsius and four degrees Celsius. And because of this simulation, the precipitation uh, ranges changes from negative 40 getting drier to the positive 40 getting wetter, where uh, the 
point here, the key takeaway from this point is the precipitation increases in this equator, equatorial Pacific line, this blue line, and in the high latitudes here at the north and the south. High latitude increases the precipitation, whereas the simulation shows that uh, there is a decrease in precipitation in the some part, two parts over the parts of the subtropic, these two lines, subtropic, and the limited areas of tropic area, this portion. So there is a decrease in precipitation. So for the soil moisture, uh, simulated at 1.5 degrees Celsius change, 2 degrees Celsius, and 4 degrees Celsius. Here it ranges from negative 1.5 to 1.5. So the soil moisture, since the soil moisture is the function of precipitation and temperature, both precipitation and temperature affects the soil moisture. So as the precipitation increases, soil moisture increases. But as the temperature increases, soil moisture decreases due to the evapotranspiration from the soil and plants. So the more dominant effect in soil moisture is precipitation than temperature. That is what the story that is what the study shows here. So the sea level rise, the figure here on the left is the globally average sea level change. On the uh, left, this y-axis, globally average sea level change. And on the x-axis, we have the time period from 1850 to 2000. So what uh, this figure uh, summarizes is, there is a high confidence in the rate of sea level rise since the mid 19th century, which is larger than the mean for the previous two millennia. And also the study shows that it is very likely that the mean sea rate global average sea level rise was 1.7 mm per year between 1901 and 2010, 2 mm per year between 1971 and 2010, 3.2 mm per year between 1993 and 2010. So here we can see how the sea level is rising for decade or within a short span of time. So what does all these mean uh, to India? So the global mean sea level rise will continue to rise over the 21st century for India, which has a coastline of over 7,500 kilometers. This will mean a significant threat to those living in areas vulnerable to the impacts of the sea level rise. Cryosphere. So the cryosphere contains the frozen parts of the planet. Here we have the first figure, Northern Hemisphere Spring Snow Cover. And on the x-axis, we have the time period from 1900 to 2000. And the below figure is for the Arctic summer sea ice content. So the summary of this graph here we have the Northern hemisphere spring snow cover has continued to decrease in extent since the mid 20th century. There is a high confidence glacier have continued to shrink almost the worldwide. And glacier have lost mass and contributed to the sea level rise throughout the 20th century. So from both the figure here, we can see the decreasing trend. Also in the Arctic summer sea ice content, here we can see the decreasing trend as the time period increases. So to understand the climate change and to mitigate and uh, adopt the sources uh, for the change in the climate, there are different scenarios studied. So now we'll discuss why these scenarios are necessary. So the scenarios of the different rates and magnitude of climate change provides a base or basis for assessing the risk of crossing identifiable threshold in both physical change and impacts on biological and human systems. Here we can see the climate change, temperature, precipitation, sea level rise and extreme event as a result of the climate change which impact the vulnerability of the ecosystem, food security, and human health, which, is, which then directly impact the socioeconomic development. So these cycle, how this human system and the earth system are interconnected. To understand the system, scenarios are necessary or important. And along with this, now the mitigation and adaptation two factors are equally important to balance this cycle. 
So the goal of working with scenarios is not to predict the future. It is not used to predict the future, but to better understand uncertainties and alternative future so that we can be prepared for in the face of the climate change. This is what scenarios do. So brief history behind the scenarios. Since establishment of the IPCC report, different scenarios has been using for understanding the climate change and understanding the uncertainty of the climate. So initially in 1992, the IPCC first said climate change scenarios since I called IS-92. And in 2000, the improved version of the IS-92, IPCC released a second generation of projects and special reports on emission series, mm -hmm. SRES. And again, the updated version in 2007, representative concentration pathways was introduced. The latest updated version of the scenarios, there are five shared socioeconomic pathway introduced in the year 2021, which will be used in the assessment report six. Brief description for the shared socioeconomic pathway. Shared socioeconomic pathway are five 21st century pathways of greenhouse gas emissions and atmospheric concentrations, air pollutant, and land use adopted by the IPCC for its assessment report six. The pathways are used for climate modeling and research describing five possible climate futures, all of which are considered possible depending on how much greenhouse gases are emitted in the years to come. The SSPs are named after possible range of radiative forcing values in the year 2100 relative to the pre-industrial values, which was from the year 1850 to 1900. So they are based on CMIP-6, which is a climate model, the updated version of the climate model, CMIP-6. So we have here five different scenarios, which starts from ranges from 1.9 to 8.5, being 1.9 being very low greenhouse gas emission, 2.6 low greenhouse gas emission, 4.5 intermediate, 7 high, and 8.5 being very high greenhouse gas emissions. So the future emissions cause future addition. Future emissions cause future additional warming with total warming dominated by past and future carbon dioxide emissions. So here on the left, we have the carbon dioxide emissions per year on the y-axis from the year 2015 to the 2100, which is a future projection. For the different scenarios uh, ranging from 1.9, very low carbon dioxide emission to the 8.5, very high carbon dioxide emission. Here we can see the differences between the different scenarios for the carbon dioxide emissions, as well as here uh, the report also has non-carbon dioxide gases like methane. We can see here methane, uh, range, range of methane is very high as compared to the carbon dioxide gas uh, due to which there are also different actions being taken for reduction of the methane gas in the atmosphere. And uh, non-carbon dioxide gases like nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide. So all these gases contribute to the global warming which we will see here in the next slide. So this slide is the continuation of the previous slide, which is the contribution to the global surface temperature from different emissions. Like here for the scenario 1.9, we have the global surface temperature increase on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the different gases contributing to the global temperature rise. This is total observed, and this is for carbon dioxide contributing to the global surface temperature increase, similarly non-carbon dioxide greenhouse gases and aerosol land use. So here for the carbon dioxide, we can see among all the different types of sources responsible for global surface temperature increase, carbon dioxide has the dominant impacts for global warming. And the same is true for other scenarios, rest of the scenarios. Here we can see the carbon dioxide as a dominant effect for increasing the temperature, for the temperature rise, global surface temperature rise. 
So the table here is the summary of the previous graphs where we have the scenarios on the left corner, the very first column. Scenarios ranging from low, uh, very low greenhouse gas emission 1.9 to 8.5, very high greenhouse gas emissions for the, and the temperature estimated, increase in temperature estimated for the near term 2021 to 2040, mid term 2041 to 2060, and long term 2081 to 2100, where we have two columns for each term with the best estimate and very likely range. Same goes for midterm and long term. So for the near term, we have the maximum rise in temperature being 1.6 degrees Celsius, which ranges from 1.3 to 1.9, and 2.4, the maximum temperature for the mid term, which ranges from 1.9 to 3. Similarly, for long term, maximum temperature being 4.4, which could rise uh, between the range of 3.3 .3 to 5.7. So this is a climate change prediction, which is projected in three different terms. Now, this is the summary of all the graphs and tables which we have seen so far. This graph here is the global surface temperature increase since 1850 to 1900 on the y-axis as a function of cumulative carbon dioxide emission on the x-axis. So the x-axis here is the cumulative carbon dioxide concentration, whereas y-axis is the global surface temperature increase. Also, we have the time period from 1850 to 2050, projection up to 2050. Here, what we can see is uh, different scenarios, five different scenarios representing the increase in the global surface temperature, how the temperatures are increasing. And the shade here with uh, each line represents the uncertainties present in the model due to the different uh, uncertainty sources like clouds, ocean, greenhouse gases, which we just saw uh, in the previous slides. So this is the temperature increase according to the different scenarios uh, till 2050. And there, here we can see a nonlinear relationship between cumulative carbon dioxide concentration and the increase in global surface temperature. So the key takeaway from this slide is every ton of carbon dioxide adds to the global warming. Okay, so the figure here, the last figure from the summary for policymaker 2021 report, total cumulative carbon dioxide taken by land and ocean and the remaining in the atmosphere represented by gray color under five illustrative scenarios from 1850 to 2100. So on the y-axis, we have the carbon dioxide concentration. And on the x-axis, we have here in the graph is shown how much is uh, like land and ocean, how much carbon dioxide is sink in land and ocean and in the atmosphere, depending on the scenarios. So here on the extreme left for the 1.9 scenarios, we can see more than 50%, 70% of the carbon dioxide sinks in land and ocean, and only few remaining portion is in the atmosphere, since this 1.9 scenarios has a very low carbon dioxide greenhouse gas emissions. But the same thing if we see here on the extreme right for the 8.5 scenarios, which is responsible or which has a very high greenhouse gas emission, only 38% is covered or sinks in the land and ocean and the remaining is in the atmosphere, which means the key takeaway point from this slide is the proportion of the carbon dioxide emission taken up by land and ocean, carbon sink is smaller in scenarios with higher cumulative carbon dioxide emissions. So, So what does all this report graphs and table, the report summary for policymaker mean for India, the IPCC report? So the study shows that heat extremes and drought events will be the new normal. 
The situation will only worsen if we do not act faster and decisively. But already various action has already been taken or started or is being taken. For example, few, uh, few of the actions uh, being taken in India or all over the world are in India. This is in India. So installation of 450 gigawatt of renewable energy by 2030 by the government to tackle climate change using electric vehicles, tackle deforestation, reduce methane emissions. So with the change in climate, uh, but with this changing climate, there are uh, various risks and impact caused by the change in the climate in different sectors like effects on human health, losses of ecosystem, flood and drought, risk of food insecurity. So these risks differ according to the magnitude and climate change, magnitude of climate change and both regional and socioeconomic differences. So for this, uh, the term adaptation and mitigation is very important to balance these impacts of the climate change factors in future as well as in recent years. So the term mitigation is defined as uh, the way to keep climate change impacts moderate than extreme and mitigation benefits are global. The adaptation is a response to the strategy, the way to keep climate change impacts moderate than extreme or to cope with impacts that cannot be avoided. Whereas adaptation benefits are often more localized. So the various action that we can take for, uh, for minimizing these climate change impacts are substantial emission reductions over the next few decades can reduce climate risk in the 21st century and beyond, increase prospect for effective adaptation, reduce the cost and challenges of mitigation in the longer term and contribute to climate resilient pathways for sustainable development. So here, now we have a short two minute video for climate adaptation and mitigation. So after this video, we will again continue with the presentation. Have you noticed how climate is changing? And when we say climate, we're not referring to day-to-day -day changes in weather. We're talking long-term trends, changes that you can only see over a long period of time, like shorter ice cover on lakes, warmer average winter temperatures, longer summers, more frequent heat waves and flooding from severe storms. These changes in climate can be difficult to see as we go about our daily lives, but they are important because they impact our communities, economy, and culture. The way we live is based on the climate we live in. Warmer winters means less ice fishing, snowmobiling, and cross-country skiing, all vital parts of our culture and economy. Longer summers mean farmers have a longer growing season, but more bugs and diseases to deal with. Heat waves may be nice if you're on the beach, but they can harm vulnerable people like the elderly and young or those who don't have access to cooler places. And flooding from heavy rain can destroy homes, roads, and crops. As our climate continues to change, impacts are becoming more and more serious. And even if climate change is not impacting your community now, it will soon. But how and when we react, though, is up to us. We can adapt, which means we change the way we live based on how our communities are being impacted. If flooding is a problem, we can redesign stormwater systems to handle more water. And we can plant trees and crops suited for longer, warmer growing seasons. We can plant vegetation to provide more shade for cold water trout streams, keeping the water temperatures down. And we can develop heat emergency action plans to assist vulnerable people during heat waves. Adaptation, identifying and preparing for the impacts of climate change helps in the short run and can save property, money, lives, and even wildlife. But in the long run, if we are to slow climate change, we have to curb emissions of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases in an effort to reduce global warming. This is called mitigation. Small steps like driving and flying less, increasing energy use, or reducing consumption are all examples of mitigation. 
But if the mitigation of climate change is to be effective, it has to be on a large scale, which means we have to reduce harmful emissions as individuals, as communities, as businesses, as states, as countries, and collectively as a world. Okay, so uh, in order to, for the adaptation steps for mitigation of this climate change action, there are various uh, actions already being taken in our society or in the world. One of them uh, is sustainable development. So we'll just briefly discuss about the sustainable development, how we can, uh, what is sustainable development and what are the some objectives of sustainable development. So uh, this sustainable development is the actions taken to reduce human influence on climate change, one of the actions. So the term sustainable development is defined as the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So the sustainable development is uh, also responsible for green building. Green building is also termed as sustainable building, which is environment friendly, structure and resource efficient. So the green building, uh, this LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, which is the US Green Building Council, which was the first LED certification council established in the United States. But by now there are various LED buildings or the certification councils established all over the world. So uh, for to receive this LED certification, there are four different levels, which is LED certified, silver, gold, and platinum. Depending on the points that we achieve in building our house, we will get the LED certified uh, depending on the points we receive. So in order to achieve this certification or to gain these points, we have to fulfill these credit categories, which are listed here. And we'll discuss in detail in our next slide. So this is innovation and design. There are different credit categories in the green building, which are innovation and design, location and linkage, sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, material and resources, indoor environmental quality, awareness and education. So the logo here on the bottom left, LED gold is from one of the building. So this LED gold building might have received the point somewhere between 60 to 79 by fulfilling these credit categories. So that's uh, how it received the LED gold. Similarly, the building with this logo LED silver this building might have received points somewhere between 50 to 59 by fulfilling or achieving this credit categories listed here. So here, this is a project checklist of the LED version four for building design and construction. For now, let us only focus on the water efficiency category here. If we fulfill all the requirements of the water efficiency category, we will receive 11 points. In that way, we can fulfill the categories, uh, credit categories of other like location or sustainable sites and accumulate points. And depending on how much point we can like gain or accumulate, we will receive the certification label. So now again, focusing back on water efficiency. Uh, for example, if we fulfill this credit, outdoor water is reduction, we will receive two points. So now uh, uh, one might ask, how can we fulfill the outdoor water is reduction? So they will have the LED certification council itself. They will itself have a different criteria to fulfill these categories. For example, for outdoor water is reduction. So instead of using the portable drinking water from the municipal tap, we can start uh, doing the water, rainwater harvesting. So in that way, we can use the outdoor water use reduction. We can reduce outdoor water use so that we can receive or achieve point two here by fulfilling this credit. So in a similar manner, all other credit categories work. Every categories will have a checklist like this so that we can achieve different LED certification. And uh, one more thing, 
not only the new building can achieve the LED certification, also the old building that goes under renovation, fulfilling the LED discredit categories are also eligible for receiving the LED certification and, and be green building or sustainable building. So the main objectives of the sustainable development are focused in this three system, people, planet, and profit. So these three are the backbone of the sustainability, which uh, has the main objectives to water and solid waste management, water and air quality standards, management of hazardous materials, reduce, recycle, and reuse, energy and atmosphere, and innovation. So this is building is one of the example of Apple Park, California, which uh, the building runs on 100% renewable energy, including solar energy and biofuels. Here we can see the black shade on top of the building all over the 360 degree. So these all are solar panels in build. So the building uses a natural ventilation system, no air conditioning or heating needed for 75% of the year and 80% of the site is green and the recycled water is used to keep the campus green. So the 51% of the construction firm are shifting their business towards sustainable. This uh, data is for the United States. So the climate change is a global emergency which requires international cooperation and coordinated solutions. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Before I would like to open for the discussion, public discussion and questions, I have a few slides that I'd like to share with everyone here in the presentation today. So our team TGIS also has the upcoming webinars on surfer mapping tool on 30th October, which is open for public registration. Also, we have upcoming webinars on basic R programming and advanced R programming on 20th and 27th November, respectively, which is also open for public registration. So, yeah, and please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Thank you for your attention. Now, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah.